Welcome to our webinar, the first in this series on homelessness, exploring the fix in the future will be the topic of the episode today. This is the first of four episodes on homelessness, exploring how to help people make the transition from public services, you know, whether it be corrections, mental health, child welfare, there are a whole array of public services that accommodate people, but at some point in time, they need to make the transition to community. Uh, and until these programs build in some form of transition readiness, it seems that homelessness is going to re remain the result, and it's growing. So we've invited from the University of Ottawa, uh, Tim Aubrey today. Uh, I'll be the host. He'll be the commentator, a brief presentation to get us started. He and I are going to discuss homelessness, who they are, and how the housing fix, or housing first, is a fix to the problem. So welcome, Tim. Over to you. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Perry, and uh, for this opportunity um, to talk about homelessness and, and housing first. Okay, um, let me, just for context, I'm just going to tell you just, just very briefly about myself, because it, it does have, uh, it, it does have implications for why I'm coming at this from, from, from um, um, uh, in terms of addressing homelessness. Um, so I'm trained as a psychologist, um, a clinical psychologist. Um, but my specialization uh, in grad school was in community mental health, and it was in particular with a focus on deinstitutionalization um, and the closing uh, of our psychiatric hospitals. I went to the University of Manitoba during the 80s. They were reducing their beds. And of course, we went to a place where uh, we've pretty much closed um, the large psychiatric institutions across the country. So. My interest right from the beginning of my career was on how do you support people um, with um, severe and persistent mental illness um, to live in the community and, and, and to live in a, in a way that's you know, productive, that's uh, integrated, um, and so on. So uh, the last 30 years, my research has been around on services, on support services. About 15 years ago, I started to work more on the issue of homelessness. It was starting to increase. And um, I would, got involved, I, you know, initially it was all about observing, understanding homelessness, but then I was interested in trying to solve it. Um, and I got involved, I was on the, um, the, the team, the research team that did the big trial at home, Chez Soi demonstration project in five cities across the country. That ended about 10 years ago, but it was really the biggest test to this day uh, of housing first uh, as an approach uh, to address homelessness for people who are chronically homeless. And, and, and that's gonna be my focus. Um, so I'll walk you through here. Uh, I'm gonna talk initially about the types very quickly. Perry asked me to do that. Um, and then I'll go from there to introducing you to Housing First, uh, and I'll do that also quite quickly. Um, a little bit on the current status of research. It's, a, it's an evolving, it's a growing uh, research base. Uh, and then as a framework, talk about why this approach is a good one to address chronic homelessness. What, what makes it a, an approach that we should scale up? Um, and, and where we've done some of that, but not enough. And, and, and certainly that's my, my opinion. Um, you know, and, and then we'll just talk about some of the policy challenges we're facing around Housing First, and then I'll be happy to, um, um, to answer your, uh, your questions. So when we define homelessness, we, we focus especially on people who are absolutely homeless, we know them, we, we see them increasingly, uh, they're more visible on the streets. Um, there's unsheltered group um, and, and post pandemic, th this is being seen particularly around the encampments that have shown up in, in cities across the country. We do have emergency shelters across the country. Um, um, that's been our, our main response to homelessness for a long time now in Canada. We also have people that are hidden, um, who you know, who go from place to place. They don't have permanent housing; they stay temporarily with friends, acquaintances. 
And then you certainly have people who are at risk of homelessness, and, and particularly people who live in um, crappy rooming houses, um, single room occupancy hotels, uh, and so on. Now, I'm going to focus, as I mentioned already, on people who are chronically homeless. And I'm going to start this by just showing you very briefly um, some, some findings from a study we did. Uh, we published it in 2013. We looked at shelter users in three cities here in Ontario. And you can see them here, Toronto, Ottawa, and Guelph. And we wanted to cluster the population based on length of stay and frequency of homelessness. And you get three distinct groups. You get one group we call temporary. These are people who are going to get out of homelessness on their own. They transition. You get another group that are episodic. They're in and out. They cycle. And then finally, you have another group that they can't get out. It's chronic. It's long term. OK? The, the population I'm interested in are the ones who are long-term, chronic, and episodic. This is the group I believe we need to focus on. It doesn't mean we can't support the other people, but the other people are going to require less support to get out of homelessness, to transition out of homelessness. Okay. Now, among the population, you've got the lifespan, you've got kids and fa with families, you've got youth, you've got single adults, you've got seniors, uh, and so on. We see the chronic and episodically homeless group. It's particularly men, about two thirds to 70%. It's single people. Families, for the most part, have one episode of homelessness and they can transition out very quickly, okay? The youth, it's a little more complicated. Some of them are gonna end up chronically homeless or episodic, but we also see that some of them, um, because of their resilience, because of whatever, they are able to go through a period of homelessness and emerge on the other side and get on with their life. So what's been our response to homelessness? For the longest time, it was what was called the staircase model. People had, the, 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 when I talk about episodic, long-term chronic homelessness, the prevailing view was, you're not ready to live on your own. You, you can't keep up an apartment. So we got to help you get ready. So we've got shelters, we've got transitional housing, we might put you into group housing, and then finally you'll emerge at the other end, maybe, into independent housing or permanent housing. That model didn't really work. And you'll see the comparison that I'm gonna do between that model and housing first. Um, um, because essentially there's a whole group of people that just were stuck in the system. Um, and so the staircase model, which was prevalent um, up until housing first emerged. And now there's kind of a competition between the two, because if we're going to transform the system, you, we have to move to this housing first approach. Now the housing first approach, we collapse the staircase. Okay. The idea is we're not going to wait till you're um, stable in terms of your uh, health issues. We're not going to wait till you're abstinent. We're going to move you right into housing and support you to get the services that you need. So that's that's really what Housing First is about. It's moving right away from homelessness to permanent housing. Now, what is the approach? This is really important. It's housing and support. Moving people into housing without support is a disaster. And unfortunately, Housing First has got the reputation of doing that. And it's unfair because the true model of Housing First uses mental health, community mental health approaches that have a track record that on their own 
help people get out of homelessness. Case management, people with moderate needs, and you can see the characteristics in, on the slide, or the gold standard, which you have in Alberta, by the way, assertive community treatment, wraparound services, multidisciplinary. Okay, now a little later, I'm gonna give you the cost of this stuff because that's, that's always a question that, um, that emerges. The housing, by the way, is regular housing. We use the term scattered. It can be private market. It often is, certainly in the US. But in Canada, we've used private market and public housing. But here's the thing. We don't cluster people in the same buildings. The standard is 20% or less, OK? Um, the key to that getting this done, though, is a rent subsidy. So here, here's the thing, and I, I think you all know this, but homelessness is extreme poverty combined with vulnerabilities. And when I say vulnerabilities, there's health ones, mental health challenges, physical, chronic physical health conditions. Um, there's social isolation. Um, there's fleeing domestic abuse. I mean, there's, there, there's a whole set of factors that are part of the vulnerability. But everyone, if they had the money, they would, they would get out of homelessness very quickly. So Housing First includes a rent support or what we call a rent supplement. In the US, they call it a Section 8 voucher. Okay, so that's that, that has to be part of the package, and so does support. So, what do we know about this housing first? Well, there's a growing research base on it, and it's international. Okay, now I did a quick search just you know to give you kind of some counts of publications in, in, in the scientific literature, and you can see the first mention of housing first is 2003. Okay. Now, here's the thing. You folks in Alberta were early adopters of this approach, and you still, you still have a lot of housing first there, okay? But you can see we get, you know, into the 2010s, it starts to pick up. And some, a lot of that research is research we did in Canada with the at-home Chase Watt trial that I mentioned, okay, demonstration project. Um, it's also international. There's been five randomized controlled trials. So these, this is a rigorous research design. Um, it does include mixed methods. So we've also tried to get you know, from people their stories around what happens to them once they get housed. Um, and it also includes economic analyses. So it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty good, I would say, research base on which to um, uh, use this approach um, in a whole variety of different contexts. And I'll, I'll say let, something later in terms of the different populations. That it's let me used. interrupt you just at that point, because I might forget it later. If you can go back to that slide, something happened around 2009. It surprises me because when I talk to those in the U.S. and to some extent in Canada, the deinstitutionalization movement that began in the 70s, you would have thought that there would have been research right from 1972, 1972 right through to 2006 about deinstitutionalization, homelessness, et cetera. And yet it doesn't really kick in, at least for my CVs number, until 2009. Was there something that happened in 2009 that began to bring the researchers into this field? Well, it's it's the, the, the story, the story of Housing First, it starts in the States, created by uh, a Canadian, actually, who, who went to grad school in New York City, Samson Barris. He started publishing in the early 2000s um, research on this approach that they were using in New York City and that they eventually um, exported to uh, Washington um, and I believe Philadelphia. They ended up also setting it up in Vermont. And I think that's what gave the research some momentum. Okay. Now Thank I'm going to be honest with you. The first time I saw an article on housing first, I didn't believe the results because I know the population. I've been working with them, you know, all of my career. They were saying that after five years in their pathways program, and this, this was in a good journal, the American journal of public health, 
that after five years, 85% of those people had stayed permanently housed. I mean, those, those kind of results, uh, you know, on any intervention, you just don't see. So I was skeptical, I'll be honest with you. And it's really only through my work in the Canadian trial, the at-home demonstration project, that it became clear to me that yes, it does work. Uh, it, and it does it does go up against, uh, you know, a lot of the, 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 the kind of um, uh, stigmatization that the population gets that they can't manage, that they're not competent to live uh, independently. But as, you, but, as you, but as you pointed out, Housing First is given a bad rap when it's talked about just, just providing accommodation. You've thought about- Oh, it's, it's, it's yeah, that's, the, and I, I think quite frankly, that's unethical, eh? To just put people in housing without the proper support. I, I, it's I would- almost, it's, I almost would suggest, it's, it's almost unethical to talk about the program as being so narrow in its perspective because- Absolutely. It's more that, but it, this is, it's like, you know, the wild, wild west, right? You get out into the, the field of social intervention, social programs, you know, and there's money out there. People are going to call all sorts of things housing first. Okay. You know? Okay. Um, so I'll get, I'll walk you through these characteristics quite quickly. What's a good mental health intervention? Well, this is a framework that some researchers in the States, Gary Bond um, and Bob Drake and, and Deborah Becker came up with that says that if you can, if you can actually show an approach, a program to have these features, that's a pretty good program. That's a program you wanna scale up. So I did that with, um, uh, and, I, and I wrote an article about this uh, around Housing First. And you can see what the features are. I mean, they're, they're, they're very understandable. Um, and I'll, I'll walk you through each one and how it relates to the Housing First approach. So there is a program model. It's well-defined, okay? Um, and um, in fact, I'll talk in, in a bit about fidelity to the model, the importance of fidelity to the model. I showed you the main, the big components, housing and support and the different types of support that should come under it. But it's a very well-defined set of standards that you can follow if you're gonna do housing first. These are the fidelity domains. So you got housing, you got services, separating housing and support's important, right? Because remember it's scattered site. It's gonna be portable to support. It's focused on recovery, which is a term now used in the mental health field. It's, it's, it's kind of the goal of our mental health programs for people with severe and persistent mental illness. And there is a way of structuring these programs. So for instance, if you're going to provide case management, don't go over one staff member to 15 people. Make sure the support's intensive enough. If it's for people with high needs, don't go over 10 people per staff member. In fact, the best program is probably one to eight. Um, so there's a whole set of standards that, that are followed. Um, the program reflects client goals. Now, here's the thing. And, you know, Samson Barris tells a story about why, why did he take the risk of putting people into their own apartments and supporting them when everybody said it ain't going to work. And he said he had been working as an outreach worker um, for a few years and nothing seemed to be working. He was seeing the same people in the shelters, the same people on the street. And he finally said, you know, I think I'll just ask them, what is it they want? Is it, is it, do they need psychiatric medication? Do they need, you know, what, what exactly would make a difference? And they said to him, they said, don't you get it? I just said, I just need some housing. I, I need my own place. You know, that's, that's how I want to start this thing. You know, I, I don't need all these services where I'm, you know, answering questions all the time and never really getting anywhere. So that's where he got the idea and the term, okay, we're gonna start with the housing, but we're gonna attach the services to it. We're not, we're not just gonna put people into housing. So this approach reflects ultimately client goals. And, 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 and most people, they want some choice. 
They want to find a way of getting back into the community. And this notion of recovery is important to them. Can they set up a life in the community that's, even with the symptoms they have, with the problems they have, it's worthwhile, it's satisfying, uh, it has meaning. I think uh, a, a point I wanted to uh, want, want you to speak to is recovery is actually a force, a source of prevention. So you don't get the recidivism that seems to be so characteristic of certain population groups. So recovery isn't just rehab, recovery is prevention. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Once you get to that place and make some inroads, um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's less likely for you to slide back. Um, and, 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 you know, most people we interviewed, once they're off the street, they want to stay off the street. And they also want to, and it's not easy, they want to disconnect from their street networks. Eh? That, that's the other part of the story. Which is, which is a big challenge for a lot of these programs. Programs have to also be consistent though with what society wants to accomplish. And, and, and I, think, I think in general in Canada, we're, we're like a lot of the Western countries, we don't like homelessness. We want people housed. We may not know yet how to do it, you know, and, and, and so on, but we sure want it to happen. And the the national housing strategy, which has not been usually effective, quite frankly, that came out in 2017, the, the federal government put out, but it did say in it, and there has been legislation passed that we want the country to move to a right to housing like some of the other European countries. But they're saying we're gonna use a progressive realization of that value or principle. Yeah, let me pick up on that as well, um, Tim. Uh, Canada has a lot of rural territory. Uh, when yes. you have a comprehensive program such as you're referring to, does it only apply to our urban environments or because homelessness does appear to be an issue in some of our smaller or suburban communities? No, we, we actually tested a in Southeast New Brunswick the housing first, um, and it was it was it was just as effective. And I mentioned Vermont. Eh? Vermont has a statewide uh, housing first program. Um, it's often linked to a program that's in the city, and you have to do some tweaks to it because there's more travel time. You've got to use technology to keep in touch with people. You got to make sure they get enough support, otherwise, and you have to find the housing. You have to find the housing. But we were able to do that in a small scale um, um, in New Brunswick. And I, I really think it's something we can, um, and there, I, I'm sure I could find some other examples of rural programs in, in Canada. Uh, I'm gonna do a talk at Lanark County. I don't know if any of you are from this area on, uh, on Tuesday, and it's gonna be about uh, rural housing first. Um, another feature. It's got to work. It's got to be effective. Okay, so here, here's here's the trial we did. Over two thousand people were in it. it split almost even. I think a little more than eleven hundred or eleven hundred got housing first. The rest got um, treatment as usual. And treatment as usual was the staircase model. In some cases, it was anything else in the community, shelters, the, that kind of stuff. So. We got the same results in the five cities. You can see in each region, we have a city. The red line is housing first. The blue is treatment, what we call treatment as usual, anything else. The red line spikes in the first six months, moving people right away into the housing. And then it plateaus. These are three month periods percentage of time stably housed. So you can see it sits at about 80% uh, is, is, is stably housed in terms of time um, across a, the two year period. Now, um, another though feature is there has to be a minimum of negative effects. So it's effective around the housing 
there are some negative effects, but I think given given the 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 strength of the effectiveness, these are kind of mitigated. However, people do once they're in housing, say they're there's loneliness, they're isolated socially. I remember it's scattered site housing. It depends on the, the program, but somewhere between 10 and 20% of people, it's not going to work. Okay. And we, we have to we have to pay attention to that. We, we, we've got to do something to, to find a, an alternative for those people. And, and we did some of that work in Moncton where I was most involved and came up with a really clever program that if, if you ask about it later, I can tell you about it. Not not to take you off track here, but it might be worth referencing. When you talk about scattered housing, you're talking about people living in communities. And yeah. I can recall during the days when we were involved in community service integration with people with developmental disabilities, we spent a lot of time uh, assessing and working with neighbors before we developed a group home to make sure that, that neighborhood was in fact acceptable. Is the, the NIMBY? Eh? The, the, you wanted to you wanted to address NIMBY, yeah, and not my backyard stuff. Yeah. Right. So, so is the is this a value incorporated into your housing first program, where you actually will look at neighborliness uh, before you insert or look for a a home for a population that might be considered marginalized? Well, you know, certainly, certainly, you want people to get to know their neighbors, but we don't announce that so and so is moving into an apartment down the hall. I mean, it's a bit like like you and I, if we move into an apartment, nobody announces that to anybody. And that's that yeah, that's to me is one of is one of the, the positive features is it's it it anonymizes people in the community. Okay, but that, that's that's a good point. But that's not exactly the point I'm making. If I was moving into a neighborhood with my family, I would want to know something about the neighbors and the neighborhood I'm moving into before I move in. So when you assess the viability of a neighborhood to be part of your program is that pre is there a precondition of what appears to be an accepting or not accepting neighborhood well it's or, i mentioned the house, choice the availability of the house yeah i mean I, I mentioned choice choice is important obviously there's limits because you know the 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 rent subsidies there's a certain limit that they're set at um we're talking studio or one bedroom apartments. We're not, we're not talking houses and okay. so on. Okay. Um, um, but certainly some people, you know, will, the support they get will include, uh, you know, trying to help them get connected uh, in their neighborhoods and in their communities. Okay. Well, there's a concept in the field of normalization called deviancy juxtaposition, which says do not put people into an environment where that environment will just perpetuate the marginalization. Of Absolutely. The Absolutely. Yeah, so that's you're not a that, slum. No, that's, that's why I'm that's why I was saying that when we talk to people after they're in their housing, yeah. they want to they want to start a new life. They, okay. they, they don't want to go back to their old networks, Thank which you. I think is what is what you're getting at here. Yeah. Yep. Um, Long, it has to be long term, the outcome. So so we did have we do have data where in Toronto, people were followed for six years. And you can see here, it's kind of interesting that the, the bottom figure is uh, people getting case management with moderate, moderate level of needs. There's still a gap after six years, but it's closer. But people with high level of needs, the, the, the gap remains the same and it's a fairly big gap. So that's this is this this was data that shows that this has sustainability from the standpoint of the housing outcome. Now I will mention the evidence around what we call psychosocial outcomes, things like quality of life, community integration, even even functioning. It's more mixed. It's not, it's definitely not as strong as the housing outcomes. And it's variable in the study. We found that people, for instance, had significant drops in uh, use of drugs, consumption of alcohol, but it was a similar level as people in treatment as usual. We, 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 we didn't see, we didn't see a difference, okay? 
The other concern around negative outcomes, I just want to mention is the mortality one. So far, the data doesn't suggest that moving people into their own housing produces more deaths, but it's something you want to track. And particularly given we're living in a, in a, in a, in a period now with this opioid crisis, where people who are on the margins are particularly vulnerable. Um, and, and, you know, two thirds of them typically have a history um, uh, of substance use. Um, and then the cost one, and we're always interested in costs. So we did, we did quite a rigorous uh, kind of analysis of in the Canadian trial of costs. And, I, and I'm gonna say essentially three things here around costs, what it costs, um, what are the offsets and how much does it end up being per day? People with high needs, this was these, these are 2016 values that we published. Today, it would probably be closer to 22,000, between 22 and 23,000 a year, all in. Rent subsidies, all the support, that's the cost. So that's, that's what it costs to get somebody with high needs out of homelessness, okay? Now, there's an offset. So, and the, what I mean by offset is there's a reduction in healthcare use, there's a reduction in social service use, and there's a reduction in implication in the in the um, judicial system, you know, and, and contacts with the police and so on and so forth. High needs, seven almost seventy percent of the program is has this cost offset. So there's a reduction in that use of those services. Case management all in is about between 15 and 16,000 in today's dollars. The offset um, is a little bit less than half, okay? And you can see what it would cost per day. And of course, if we compare that cost per day to cost for shelters, it's less, okay? Um, now, not surprisingly, people with the highest service use save the most money. I mean, that's just that's just the way it is, whether it's Housing First or any other kind of programs that, um, that we talk about. I always say, to me, what's important is, what's the cost to move somebody who's been chronically homeless into housing that's gonna be sustainable? And in my world, spending 16,000 a year or 23,000 a year I think it's a pretty good it's a it's a pretty good investment but I'll I'll be interested in hearing your your thoughts about that. Well this obviously would appeal to those that have a cost sensitivity to what the social outcomes uh should be. Uh but let me ask you because if 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 you put a lot of emphasis on cost and all of a sudden you're looking at low cost labor and you're finding you're degrading the quality of your outcomes. Uh, have you found, or you looked at all about whether or not? Well, what's the labor? What's the what's the source of your labor for your programs? Well, it the support. It's the support group, right? So it's it's people who come out of social service training, who come out of mental health service training. Um, some of them are are you know from the medical field, psychiatrists, psychologists social workers, psychiatric nurses. Um, there is an element of, of even peer support, which is a new category in the mental health system where people who have had an experience of homelessness and, and have had uh, health issues, they now become support workers. That, that's, that's kind of encouraged um, in this approach. We don't see it in all the programs, mind you. I know. Uh... Um, we're going to hear from someone who I know is viewing us today that has a program in Toronto where they look at the community itself as a source of support. Now, whether or not yes. that's highly professional or your peer to peer or your supportive neighbors or the fact that we, the concept of community is that there are people to be helpful. Absolutely. Um, and so the, the more you can tap into that, the better this stuff is going to work. And the more integrated your program is. And absolutely. 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 Um, uh, so just to get down to the last couple of features, it's implementable. 
And I, and I did a study with uh, programs in nine countries, uh, it included Canada, the US, but also Europe, across the, uh, countries in Europe. And we looked at fidelity. And what I mean by fidelity is, are they meeting this? There's about 40 standards that the program has. Remember, it's well-defined. To what extent are they meeting the standards? Okay. Now that line is, above it is high fidelity. This is rolling up all the nine countries, the programs in the nine countries, to get an average. So you can see for the domains uh, out of the six or the five domains, three of the five are above considered high fidelity. The other two would be moderate service array and program structure. You're always going to get adapt adaptations. And, and but but overall, the fact that the this approach can be put in Ireland, Belgium, Norway, um, um, you know, down in Portugal, and they more or less look the same, suggests that it's it's the, the approach is flexible enough that you can implement it. Well, I'm going to jump in here again. I just had a conversation yesterday with some people in the U.S. that said one of the difficulties they're having in instituting programs of this nature is they can't find evidence to satisfy the politicians that their approach is afford not just affordable, is effective. And yet everything I've heard today, and I've got to say, Tim, uh, I was going to do this in wrap up, but I'll do it right now. This has been an extraordinary presentation to this point because I, I did not realize that what you were going to bring forward today was more than just shelter, the availability of shelter, nor would I was I expecting evaluation uh, documentation. So why why in the U.S. are they having such difficulty proving to people that there, there is effectiveness in the programs that are, are available in Canada? This person was saying she was envious of what she saw going on in Canada. Why, why is this not spilling over into the U.S.? Or is it? Well, no, but, but I think it is so, Perry. Uh, the, I'll give you an example. Uh, and it's quite an interesting example. Um, Housing First has been central to the approach as an approach in working with veterans who, who are homeless. Mm -hmm. And over a period of about 10 years, it's not even 10 years, using housing first they cut veteran homelessness in half and huge numbers huge numbers um i think the issue is not you know we're not we're not using it i think the issue and particularly in canada is we're not using it enough we're well, competing with all these other approaches that don't have evidence that's really the problem Seattle, San Francisco, I mean, the LRT in Edmonton, I mean, if this is working, uh, or programs... And, and, it, and, it is, and it's even working in Edmonton, by the way, and it's working in Calgary, but we haven't transformed the system. We're doing it in addition to all the other old stuff that we've been doing forever. That's my take on, 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 on where, why the system right now... But there's another issue that I, I want to talk to you about, which is the prevention one that we can we can we can use this approach uh, to work up prevention. Look, final thing is it adaptable? So now we have evidence from the research that yes, it works with young people. Um, it works with older adults. It works. We did a study here in 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 Ottawa, people with severe addictions. We got very similar housing outcomes. Um, it's been implemented around the world. Winnipeg has indigenized the approach, and it's 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 being offered by indigenous agencies. Okay, um, um, and then the, there's an interesting program in Toronto with a, a an agency called the Cross Boundaries um, that works with ethnic minority groups and and uses a more racialized approach. So it's adaptable, I guess is is my point. So just to finish, I've, I've talked about this. I'm, I'm just going to say, to get at your question, why we don't have more of this? What, why has it not been scaled up to a sufficient amount? It's, there are some complications in that in Canada around homelessness, there's three levels of government involved. And they have to be on the same page. So that's that's number one. This has to involve, you said it earlier, uh, Perry, 
it's not one ministry. You got housing, you got health. If you're going to work with youth, you got to you got to get into child welfare. If you're going to work with people coming out of prisons, you got to you got to work with the, the Ministry of Justice. So there's that complication. You have to get past the silos. We don't capitalize on our mental health services enough to address homelessness. Those are the best approaches, intensive case management and assertive community treatment. In Ontario, we have 80 plus programs of assertive community treatment. Only about four or five of them are involved in Housing First, okay? Rent supplements, small amounts, not enough. And then the lack of affordable housing in big cities. And that's variable across the country, but you do need affordable housing, you know, rentals. Um, and then I think we're, we've headed, you know, and it gets back to what you've talked about with people with developmental disabilities. We like grouping people. We like putting people in specialized homes and we like segregating from others. And if you start with the idea that people can't live independently, that approach is gonna be a lot more attractive. And right now with the rapid build initiative of the federal government, we're pouring money into these group programs rather than uh, housing first. So I'll leave it at that. Um, it gives you a kind of a tour of the approach. I probably talked too long, but I, I wanted to really kind of highlight those those different points. With well, you. I'll tell you, every minute you you spent was uh, well worth it from my perspective. This was uh, superb, uh, Tim. I uh, you you've exceeded my expectations, and I I trust uh, th those that are with us today as well. I'm going to go through a list of questions that I sh I shared with you in advance. I think we yeah, covered yeah, most for sure. You, you, you've certainly covered the complexity of the definition of who's homeless. And while you've zeroed in on, on, the, uh, on mental health, um, I'm glad that you did, because that's probably one of the most complex, that uh, simply providing a house for someone with a mental health issue or loading them up with phenothiazines is not an answer, nor has it been an answer, and contributed to the uh, research or the publication on madness and civilization by Michael Foucault that talks about from backwards to back alleys, that if you're gonna reverse that cycle since the middle ages, you've gotta do more than just provide housing or dump them in an alley. And I, I think you reinforce that. Um, the complexity of the issues extends to child welfare, uh, addictions. Even we're hearing today of the affordability of housing at universities may in fact be resulting in people living in, in, in stairways, yeah. although the presidents of the universities are challenging that. The, the second <laughs> issue we touched on was the volatility of this issue. I mean, at one time, this was sort of the domain of the professional. And I can remember being involved in firing 30 psychiatrists who would not serve people uh, in our slum area. Yeah, uh, They had one... They, they each had an average of one person who was a neurotic housewife in our suburbs. There's the mental health system, eh? Not a we responding. We need yeah. to get the professionals to wake up to the fact that there are other people of value who are marginalized, who needed yeah. attention in our society. And that was a professional issue. But it sounds like you, you've been helping break, break through that. And the social issues today are the not just marginalization, but the degrading of these people, because we talk about the, the, the needles in the alley and the, 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 the peeing in the alleys and the the, the women that are yeah. drunk, walking across the street being helped to avoid them being hit by a car. I mean, there are so many images of who the homeless are that are marginalizing and decreating the value of the population itself that it's not surprising that politicians just don't want to touch it. And yet you've elevated to a point of saying, look, we've got answers here. And we're talking here about people. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to see the approach that you've taken, but this is a highly politicized. And when someone says we're gonna provide more affordable housing, you've pointed out that that's, that's just not enough. And at 20,000 a year, this is very affordable, particularly if it's, a, it's, if it's an approach to, approach to prevention. Yeah, no, it, it, it should be. Perry, it's, it's an interesting, and somebody has written, um, I remember the author's name, but you know, for the longest time, because, you know, this has been around now. I showed you it started, you know, the term in 2003. Housing first was was acceptable to the right and left of, uh, on the political continuum. In fact, 
it was it was the Bush White House that brought in housing first. Right. Um, and and it continued. It continued uh, with Obama. Um, but it now, for some reason, it's ignited uh, the polarization and at least the extreme right, um, and certainly the Trump White House was was very against housing first. In fact, the person they brought in as the homelessness czar, this guy Marbut, who, who had worked in the shelter systems down in the US, I can't remember, Robert Marbut, he said it shouldn't be housing first, it should be housing fourth. Housing which? Housing fourth. So, you know, people, it's, it's, it's the old idea, stabilize people, get them off drugs, right. they should be working. And then maybe we can look at, at getting them housed. So this is, this is the debate. This is the debate going on, going on today. Have you touched um, on there's, something? A, there's a group of, there's a group of critics out there from the Manhattan Institute and, and other think tanks, you know, that are, that are, that are very conservative that think that it's misguided, this housing first approach. But, but aren't they also looking at housing first from a narrow perspective as if the house alone was the answer? And I think you've made that clear, at least in this presentation. That We've misidentified uh, programs that are not housing first. And, then and I, get, this business I, of putting people in housing without support, I, I'm, I'm so against that. I, I think it's, quite frankly, it's unethical. And I, I think, quite frankly, criminal. Well, it also it, it also implies that one size fits all, which clearly it doesn't, that housing, while may be necessary, it's not sufficient. And I think th th therein lies the point that you're making. Housing alone is not the answer. And if we've got problems in terms of the availability of housing, you know, we've got we've got a starting point. But uh, it's more than just a house. Yeah, absolutely. What absolutely. about the concept of agency? I, I'm, we're going to discuss that in the, one of the uh, subsequent webinars where one of the strong points that's being made is the person needs to buy in. Oh, without a doubt, eh? because I, I agree with that. And in fact, with the approach, this approach is you have to have some relationship building at the outset. Um, you know, you just don't take somebody and say, you're moving in here. You, you're going to have to work with them. You saw the spike, though, six months. Most of the people in our trial were 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 housed. Um, but it's not going to happen the first day you see them, maybe. And, you know, a good example of these encampments. You, you, you just can't go in there and, and tear them down and say, here's your housing. You're going to have to work with people and say, look, we can find you some housing uh, and with support and they're going to have to trust you um, to move ahead with that. But, but I agree the agency is important choice. I talked about choice. You got to give people some, some, some agency back because they haven't had it for so long. Um, I mean, these are invisible people, quite frankly, in, in our communities, like, you know, people would rather stay away from them. Um, but the idea that they're going to, they, and, and, you know, to give you an example, they sign a lease with the responsibilities of a leaseholder as a tenant. It's not the program that signs the lease. There are examples of that, but the responsibility in the lease, and these are, these are regular leases, is that they hold up their bargain as tenants. Well, I, I, I want to really in, uh, reinforce the point of agency. It, it, it comes up over and over again that you don't simply sweep your street clean, dump people into a facility and expect you've now got to get political credit as having solved a problem. You may have a clean alley for a while, but you, don't, you haven't solved the problem. Not, not in reality. Uh, uh, Don, you've made a, an observation here, a program in 2010 in Alberta called the Premier's Award of Excellence. Now, that was 2010. We still got the problem, but it recognized Alberta housing and urban affairs for a project that was going to end homelessness in 10 years. So that was 2010. Yes. This is 2003. Uh, yeah, so the approach, as I recall, having read about it, was that they brought numerous agencies together to advise government on what might be done and developed five priorities and 17 strategies, et cetera. But this is 2023 and the answer, the, the problem hasn't been solved. I, I'm not sure what happened, but uh, Dawn, do you want to add anything to the point and, and, and pose a question after making the observation of such a program did exist in Alberta? Well, it, this is why I wanted to kind of mention it because it was 
considered groundbreaking work at the time to put a roof over people's heads and then help them sort out their other issues. And uh, it, was the, it was the first, I think, I believe the first time that this had been done and it was yep. quite successful. And that was, they were recognized in 2010, but it had been taking place since 2008. And it does beg the question of what's happened uh, because, you know, the, the problem right now is running rampant, of course, across our country, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know what I think, quite frankly, we haven't stemmed the inflow. We move people into housing, it right. works, right. but we got a whole band of people in behind them that are getting out of prisons, that are graduating from the child welfare uh, um, agencies, um, that are that are leaving hospital without housing, and they end up in the shelters. They don't like the shelters. They end up on the street. They end up in encampments. Um, you know, I, I was in um, the Nordic countries in um, in the spring, and it, particularly the two countries right now that are on the way to eliminating homelessness. And I I wanted to find out what what are they doing that we're not doing. And my sense was there's some key strategies that are in place. I mean, obviously they have enough housing, okay? They also have, if not legislation like in Finland, right to housing, it's part of their value system. Everybody should be housed, but they do prevention. And they do prevention at the, the transition points that I mentioned. And you know, the prevention they do, and this is the thing about housing first, I'm focusing on, on people who are chronically homeless, but there's also an approach that's related called rapid rehousing. And they do that in spades in these Nordic countries. Like if you end up homeless, we're gonna get you out of there as quickly as possible. But in fact, we're also going to try to work so that you don't get evicted, okay? The rapid rehousing is not this twenty-three dollars or $24,000 a year per person per year. It's just some help to get out of homelessness with some support that's time limited. And the help does include financial support because some people need to be able to pay that first and last month's rent and they may need some money to get going. So they do those things, and then they also do housing first. They're big, big um, um, kind of into housing first. In so the countries. quicker the intervention, the more likely the success. But you've pointed out, if we could address the problem of inputs, we may be able to solve the problem of not even need homelessness programs. If our correction system is simply incarceration without preparation, if child welfare and for a child in, in foster care coming out and at an average age of 14, they're dropping out of the system and ending up in the alley. Um, you could advocate for a program of preparing for the transition, but it doesn't appear to be, it appears to be the major contributor to our problem. It's the inflow. Yeah. I think it's the inflow, but I also think, quite frankly, I mentioned it earlier. I think because we're Canadians, we try to do everything. So if we come in with housing first, we say, well, we'll continue with those programs in the shelters. We'll continue with transitional housing and we'll add some housing first to it. You got to do a transformation, quite frankly. That is extreme. I'm going to tell you from, from the research that, that I showed tonight and from my reading of it, I wouldn't be putting money into transitional housing. The only transitional housing I'd want to do is 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 for is for women fleeing domestic violence and they need a safe place for a while. So what you would do is put money in to catch them quick. Oh, without a doubt. In fact, catch them before they end up homeless. Exactly. Which is a preventative strategy. It's the prevention. And so, they do that, they do that very well in the North. So country. we're talking about a problem of the, the, the issue of collaboration between our institutional infrastructure, our public services, our welfare state that is saying, you know, we're we'll incarcerate, we'll educate, we'll do and, and then the expectation that they will somehow have the agency to move into community and learn that learn to cook themselves and learn to find jobs and learn to not pee in the alleys. 
but that's not happening. And so this, this, this schism that exists between our public service infrastructure and the community expectations is a mess. I remember when Reagan and many other countries followed with the commitment to deinstitutionalization, it lost its social agency. It became an economic initiative. And instead of moving the money from the institution to community, they That's simply cut back yeah. their budget. No, it's a good point, Perry. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in, in the field of developmental disabilities, which Margaret, who's online here, and I was involved in, the money that was used to ac uh, to accommodate, uh, that's the word, not, not warehouse or incarcerate, people with developmental disabilities, that money was used to finance the community service alternatives. We moved the money with the person to the community, and that became the vehicle for financing community service. In, in other jurisdictions, they simply cut the budget and dumped them in the dumped them in the community. I You're finding that's... financing someplace for programs like ho Housing First, either at the municipal level or through f federal re reallocation. Wh where is the funding coming from for home, home, home first, housing first? Well, it's this is this is part of the problem. There's these three levels of government. I, I look here in Ottawa, for instance, we have housing first programs that are funded uh, by the city, by our city, the city of Ottawa. Some of the fundings is through the federal homelessness initiative called Reaching Home that then gets moved over to the programs. But we also have programs that are funded by the Ministry of Health, um, the, the Provincial Ministry of Health. And here's the thing, those programs get a lot more funding. The staff are paid more, the rent supplements are more generous. So you, you don't really have standards across the board. Well, we have um, we've got entropy. We have increasing complexity as a byproduct of bureaucracies, bureaucracies breaking down, all taking some degree of ownership, but not working in a collaborative nature to make sure that. that and and this is the, the silo. The silos. Well, there's also the point of we, we've got twenty three thousand nonprofit societies in Alberta, and I, I would venture around the housing first or programs to address. <laughs> We've probably got numerous agencies dealing with the same individual without any collaboration between agencies. And I know that point has been made of the importance of collaborations making a community. No, it, it, yeah. uh, yeah. okay, we've got someone who's yeah. on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, Perry, it's yes. Margaret. Hi, Margaret. Go ahead. Can, can you hear me? Oh, Hi, I, I'm just saying um, from yes. the, from a Toronto perspective, uh, I, I dare to say that we have a calcified system here around housing. I mean, you're talking about housing first, but there are so many agencies and people involved in, in this uh, whole area right now that it, it, we, I, I would ha hasten to say that there's probably about 5% of the housing problem that's being addressed by, by this issue. Right. Yep. And, and right. What, what, what we what we had to do is is go private. And Perry knows this. Like I got so frustrated by the professionals and the social service centers that that I decided to deconstruct the pro professions. And what we do in our, our little charity here is train community residents to do social work functions, education, health functions. And they are the first point of contact for the homeless or the soon to be homeless. They are their neighbors, right? And then we, we went right into this very densely populated multicultural area and said the first group of people that are gonna support people who may become homeless or, or who are, are people who have you know, some uh, reciprocity in their hearts, if you will, right? That they're not doing it for money, they're doing it because they wanna meet their neighbor you know, we, we've coached them a little bit in terms of, well, it might be a little difficult and so on and so forth, but they persevered. And, and some of these neighbors are continuing with, with these people they've met eight, 10, 15 years ago, right? So we, we, we said, you know, we, we cannot rely. And, and it's right now, it is an emergency situation in Toronto. We, we have victims of domestic violence. Our people are looking for asylum. People are coming over from the Congo. Okay the Sudan, we cannot find housing for them. You know, mm. forget this very specific population of the homeless. It, it, it is a real emergency. 
we, we used to you know place a lot of our uh, homeless people in downtown toronto and we're sending them now to branford owen sound we just cannot find affordable housing right. in the downtown toronto area and and when i read about housing first and it's i totally agree with the concept but the notion of community and inverting the pyramid and recreating a system which starts with neighbors and and, and churches and you know, the, all the infinite resources that are there at the community level, it takes a lot of work to figure that out, a lot of work, but the social workers and the psychologists and addictions counselors, and I, Perry knows, I used to supervise hundreds of those guys. They, they've lost the feel. They sit in their offices and, and a, a number of them, I have a hard time leveraging them out to say, come on, let's get going. Let's start doing some outreach. What's your caseload? And, and get them to, you know, to do what they're supposed to be doing by virtue of the definition of their profession. Anyway, that why, that's that my harangue. That was why I fired 35 <laughs> psychiatrists. They were all sitting in their offices ma maintaining that this was not their problem. Uh, yeah. I, I must say that there are moments where I begin to feel if, if your job is to help people, I may have a problem with you. Because I, I think a job should be the, the measure of the option of last resort. If community can handle this problem on its own through goodwill and neighbor, and I, I don't want to be naive. I mean, mental health is a very complex problem. And, and fostering a child is a very complex problem. Yeah, and yeah. raising children in a classroom of 30 is a very complex problem. But somehow or another, we've got to get the system to recognize that the system exists for the person, not for the professional. For sure. Did you have a question there or a comment to make? I, 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 yeah, I have a few comments and a couple of questions. Uh, thanks, Tim, for your presentation. I thought it was excellent. Um, one of the stats that you mentioned earlier, you said that there was 10 to 20 percent of people for whom Housing First didn't work. But you didn't go into any depth or explanation about what it was for those 10 to 20 percent that made the difference. Why didn't it work for them? What were the Sailing well, we actually feet. did some research. We did some research on that because um, we were interested in finding out what are the characteristics of, um, you know, of, of, of that group of people. I think part of it is maybe th there's a support issue. One of the groups that run into problems are, are people coming out of jail who've had recent recent incarceration. That was that was a, um, a, um, a characteristic. Look, heavy substance use was also a predictor uh, of housing instability uh, in 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 uh, in the group. Um, landlord relations, which probably is not going to surprise you. I'll tell you one that was the the strongest predictor, which surprised us. We didn't see this. Is that whether or not people had a family doctor. If you had a family doctor, I guess a gatekeeper, you were more likely to have success in, in housing first. It was, were they, did they serve as advocates or do they serve as counselors? And well, advocates? we, I mean, we can only speculate because, you know, we were dealing with, you know, all of these thousand people that, that we had data on. I think they were gatekeepers. They helped people get what they needed, you know, because these are people with a lot of health issues. I mean, I didn't mention this, but the people in that in that Canadian study, 90% of them had at least one chronic health condition. Uh, I'm talking physical health condition. And, 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 and a lot of them had more than one. Uh, so, you know, you, you've got some health needs here beyond the mental health ones that um, that you're going to have to attend to um you know that that so that you know that was certainly um seemed to be um um at play this touch this touches on a point we've made numerous times and it bears reporting uh, re repeating today is the, the professional today is increasingly conscious of the importance of their relational skills not just the fact that they have medical or professional knowledge um and i, I reflect on that yeah in, in recent experiences where not just through research, but uh, as a byproduct of, of contact with the system, I'm hearing increasingly the professional saying, uh, I need you as a partner in this exercise. This is not simply a matter of take your pill and go home. 
we, we've got to work out a solution for you. And that solution is more than what the medication is. It's your lifestyle. It's your network. Uh, it's your mission. It's your agency and prepared to make a commitment to fixing your own problem. And I think we're going to hear about this throughout the series is the relevance of engaging that individual rather than the professional first is if we can get the client to buy into the fact that he has a problem and we as a community are prepared to help him support to solve it. We're on our way to a solution. Well, you know, it's interesting. There's there's new research out of Ireland. I, I was just on a, a webinar. Um, maybe it was a week and a half ago where they're, they're, they developed a tool, a very simple tool a screening tool for doctors, for family physicians to ask about housing and to ask about, you know, because people come in, they may not talk about their housing, that they're living in a car or something, you know? So the idea is you ask, I think it's only, it's only like three questions or something before you would open up a conversation if, if somebody was going through a, a housing crisis or... You know. well, you, you, you talk about prevention and we cite readily the institutional infrastructure of our public services, but there also is something about family breakdown. Mm. Uh, and I, I, I know of, in, in personally of, a, of an individual uh, in a, a friend's family where the daughter at her age 13 basically bailed out and she's been making it from, yes. from, from alley to home and yeah. has traveled to Ottawa and across the country. God knows how she does it. But family breakdown has been a major issue. And there are those advocating for less reliance on family, which I don't quite understand. But yeah, yeah. address it all, uh, the family as a source of prevention. Yeah. Yeah, there is a, there is a, a model of Housing First being tested for youth um, by Stephen Gates and his group out of York University. And one of the strategies, if it's feasible, is, is to get youth back. It's only one of, there's a whole bunch of different pathways they've laid out, but one of them is, is to see if they can get estranged kind of youth back with, with their families. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, a lot of this stuff is, is kind of common sense, you know, yeah, I, I was the idea say, of, yeah. you have homelessness, let's offer them a house. I mean, <laughs> well, why did it take us that long to get to that point? But, you but know, why, why have we devalued the relevance of the family in our social services system? Sure. Where yeah. I'm hearing, and I recall uh, a very surprising discussion I had with professors at the University of Calgary School of Social Work that saw, saw the family as archaic. And the future was the role of the state in, as the alternative yeah. to the family because yeah. they were so disappointed in what was happening, I, I was just astounded. I walked out of that that meeting with my eyes wide open or closed. Uh, that seems to be a position being taken by the left: is the family is archaic, the future mm -hmm. is the state. Yeah, I mean, in, in the context of housing first day, one of the the important things that does happen, you know, we did find that out through our interviews, is people reconnect with family. Yeah, um, it, you know because they have a place, you know, and it, it, and they're kind of proud of that. We, we heard stories, you know, of, of the idea of bringing, you know, bringing over uh, a child, like a, you know, it could be an adult child, but a daughter or son, you know, for dinner at their place now that they have their own place, you know. But, you know, the, the romantic idea of what a family is, and now both are working, houses are too expensive, so they both got to be working. The child is going to daycare. The school is spending more time with them than the parents are. They're not even sitting down to have dinner together. I mean, ha have we in fact got a crisis that is emanating out of the fact that the family is falling apart? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that 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 got a lot out of you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I, we're all looking for answers. Uh, Dawn, you got your hand up. Maybe it's relevant to the question I've just posed, but go ahead. Yes, I, I'm thinking to myself in terms of uh, being preventive and uh, maybe appraising and trying to prevent these failures. And number one, in terms of being preventive, I I'll often think about well, right back to our education system. If we don't learn what we need to at home, perhaps our education system could spend a bit more time on practical things like earning money, renting or buying a home, Paying your, being able to pay your expenses, save for the future, <laughs> retire, maybe do simulations so people better understand how that all works. And then maybe there's some things that we can do with the ecosystem 
in which we're all a part and uh, more monitoring as to, you know, let's say people move from school to employment to are they surviving well? Maybe there's some monitoring we could do there that'll flag, you know, when people are in, in, in trouble. I know a lot of these people have substance abuse issues, but, and chronic, you know, health conditions and, and that sort of thing. But I'm, I'm reading more and more about, you know, uh, seniors, you know, here's how I live on $800 a month out of my van. You know, I mean, there's, mm -hmm. Some, and people, a lot of people are one or two paychecks away from really being homeless. You hear those stories too. And so the yep. interest rates go up and if they're a bit over leveraged, they're on the street before you know it and too embarrassed to go to family, right? And so there's a lot of things operating here in the, in the system, right? No, and I, you know, I, I, when you look at it, like I said, the homelessness hits a lot of people like, you know, across the lifespan and men, women, families, and so on. The one thing they have in common is, is there's all sorts of factors that go into somebody, you know, ending up losing their housing. But they all have in common is the poverty. Um, and some people say, you know, is are, are we are we miss are we miss targeting the issue by just focusing on homelessness? Is is it really? Because and and when we talk about poverty, it's it's extreme. I mean, I we moved people into housing because they had these rent subsidies, and what happened was we have data on this. They ended up increasing their use of the food bank because now they had a place where they could make a meal. They didn't have enough money, to, you know, to meet to meet the grocery bill at, at the end of every month, so they they used the food bank. Well, there are there are some experiments. I think there's one in Hamilton, one in Vancouver, of providing uh, select groups guaranteed annual income and watching how they spend. Yes. Their, they didn't spend it on drugs and whatever. They yeah. they spend it on on necessities of living. Our premier, you know, it 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 broke my heart as a researcher, Perry. But our premier here, the, one of the first things he did eh, when he came into office was cancel the guaranteed annual income study that had just started. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's another topic. But I, but I just want to make the point, though, the poverty stuff, because that's that's why the rent supplement is so important in, in the approach in Housing First. Well, you talk about usage of vouchers. I mean, that, that's intriguing, is you're actually reinforcing agency and, and giving individuals vouchers, which are for select. And they're portable. That's, that's a brilliant uh, option where it gives the individual the capacity to exercise choice. But if the housing isn't there, I mean, they're going to have to move out of the city Oh, we've got to create housing. Absolutely. Without a doubt. We've because vouchers are, are not just a means of giving the individual choice, but they also serve as a vehicle for developing markets because they indicate there's capital available in the form of vouchers to develop housing or, or support services. So I, I like the I like the housing. I like the voucher option. Yeah. It's a means of developing solutions as well. Any other questions? I'm looking for hands. We've got 15 more minutes, which is plenty of time to to roast him. If in fact he's been off <laughs> uh, off the mark, uh, I did like the discussion around um, around prevention. But Sh Shara, go ahead. You've got a question. Uh, yeah. Hello, everybody. My question is like, so I'm coming more from say the development side, like the relationship of land, buildings, people, economy, and environment. Um, and homelessness or affordability and things like that obviously are kind of coming to a squeeze. And what I'm seeing, having lived and traveled in various different countries, you know, and now in Edmonton, I mean, it's, it's like a really big problem, like very disproportionate based on our population and how many people are in dire homelessness. Um, and of course, you know, substance abuse, mental health, and now there's a squeeze with immigrate immigrants coming in and yeah, come on in. But we have nowhere to house you. We have no other supports, right? And I'm just wondering, like, where does that leave us as far as financial capacity? Because all of this costs, right? Even our frontline workers, for example, um, you know, there's, there's such a mental toll. There's burnout, um, you know, money, throwing money at them might not solve the problem, maybe having more people trained up. But then there's a lack of housing, there's the lack of services attached to the housing. So 
I'm just kind of wondering on a grander scheme or on a bigger scale, right? Like policy regulation and implementation, yeah. where does that leave us? Because it just seems like it's getting worse. And then with the, with the economy doing as it is, it just seems to be getting worse and worse too. Well, it, no, that's a, that's a very good point, Sharon, that it, it's, you have to break it down, but you know, and it was one of the reasons why I, I went over to, to, to visit, you know, Norway and, um, and Finland. Cause I was curious to see what they're doing. Right. But, you know, closer to home, um it is doable there's two cities in uh, the u.s that have had remarkable success at reducing homelessness uh, to the point in milwaukee milwaukee is one of the cities that they virtually have no street homelessness of the unsheltered kind and and the sheltered kind has has dropped significantly houston has housed twenty five thousand people uh, using using a housing first approach now so that so we can take you know we can take models that work more systemically i mean i i present you an approach here tonight you know in a program and it works but you know on its own unless the system is set up and everybody's going in the same direction um we're going to have exactly what you're describing, um, which is a whole, you know, mixture of approaches. Some of them work, some of them don't work, um, and people aren't on the same page. And, and I think that's part of where we're at right now in in most of our cities, quite frankly, across Canada. I mean, I certainly know it well here in Ottawa because I because I live here. Um, and then I also think we got to think prevention. I, I really think the inflow. We got to we got to fix that inflow problem. Oh, well, um, we've reinforced that. I mean, the editorial that was the focus of the editorial yes, setting yes. up the series was uh, wh where is this population coming from, and it is being made. I mean, I, I recall when we were arguing uh, about a number of individuals in the hundreds that were being placed into an institution, and we did a developmental assessment before and after. And they were worse off as a byproduct of being in that institution. So some of our programs, and this was one of the arguments in the U.S., that the correction system has been incarcerating people. And in fact, their situation of being able to integrate back into the community is less or worse than before they went in. And so we, we are actually creating some problems. In fact, we're, we're creating an industry, an economy, and we're creating a lot of jobs uh, before yeah. the fact and after the fact. And maybe that's part of what the... The tongue in cheek, maybe that's what the politicians are after. We're just this whole business has become a job maker. Yeah. Well, and I also think though, you know, part of you know, we talked about housing, affordable housing, the lack of it. Unfortunately, when it comes to the issue of homelessness, you know, we're competing against first home buyers. Yep. I mentioned we're competing against students, we're competing against uh our immigrants. Um, there's a lot of players out there. And quite frankly, people who are homeless, you know, they don't vote for the most part. They really don't have, um, you know, kind of a, a much of a voice. Um, so it's it's hard to get the issue on the public agenda. I, I, I maybe because you know how visible it's become, uh, how many encampments there are across the country that's happening. Um, well, that, that was a point I was going to make, Tim, is that this is becoming visible. I mean, I, this is unusual that the KEI network is typically focused on emerging technologies. Yes. And, yeah, yeah. Impact. and we've picked up on healthcare reform because of the extraordinary waiting list, which is personalizing the issue. And yeah. what we're seeing in our alleys and our LRTs is what Michael Foucault talked about is we, we've got alleys, you know, and, and uh, Geraldo Rivera said, I've shown you what it looks like. You've heard what it sounds like. I can't tell you what it smells like, but that that could apply to alleys in our community as well sure. as yeah. institutions. So as this becomes much more of a political issue because it is becoming, the public's becoming more aware of, they can't even ride their LRT and they don't feel safe going to the upper. Um, no, they so have to walk through the, 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 the tunnels. Yeah, the risk that we run is the solutions that we've opted for in the past, which is not tents and shelters, 
but an institution of a few thousand in order to clean our streets up. Well, and I the, we've got some of that happening eh, with with larger and larger specialized houses. Because it's looked at as an economic issue, not as a social consequence. Yeah, although, you know, here's the thing, eh? The, the, the little bit of research that's, that's costed specialized housing or uh, group housing with on-site support shows it's clearly more expensive than, than the scattered site because you have to have 24 hour support on site. Yep. Um, and and so what always, you're doing to you make can it- You always reduce your staffing ratios when it comes time to do your budget. Well, and, yeah, and, and the minister is happy to take that to cabinet. I mean, yeah. you know, let, let's be clear. Institutions have a certain allure for people that look at it as an economic issue, not a social issue. The social consequences is what we need to continue to reinforce. No, absolutely. And, I, and I'm not a I'm not woke by any means. No, but no, I, I personalize this problem. Before. It's going to become an economic one, and we're going to live to regret it. Because the easy solution is clean your communities and dump them into a the ship of fools floating on the Thames, or put them in a in an institution and everyone will be happy again because it'll be ignored until Geraldo Rivera comes along again and and we dump them in the community and we go through another cycle. That's my well, and, you know, I'll give you an example. I don't know if any of you are from or have lived in uh, Kitchener-Waterloo, but they had an encampment and their solution is along the lines of what you're saying is they put up um, this community of they're kind of shipping containers. They're calling them tiny homes or tiny cabins or something. But guess where they put it? I mean, it. If you you couldn't make this stuff up, they put this village of containers next to the city dump. Sure. <laughs> outside, outside. I, I have a colleague there, who, you know, who taught at Wilfrid Laurier for years, and he was just outraged by how bad that was. Look, in Maine, there is a community, and this is not necessarily negative, but it's a housing a housing first option. They put uh, portable uh, bathrooms and they put uh, food trucks in a park and they set up a, a, a tent city and they said, this is our solution. We've got yeah, no, it's. I mean that's, and then they call it innovative, probably. Well, they're experimenting. Maybe that's uh, maybe that's the positive is they're trying something yeah. at least. Yeah. Uh, Tom, you've got a family that's involved in some aspect of this back in Toronto. Uh, anything you want to share with us about your perspective on what we've been talking about today? Well, I I I found this whole discussion really quite a revelation, and it's been really interesting, and I do very much Tim, very much appreciate uh, what you've had to say today because my daughter is an advocate for homeless people in Toronto mm. and I'm I really appreciate being able to uh, get some background on the subject because I'm, I haven't got a clue what I should respond to her with you know so um, you probably come across my daughter Zoe uh, Dodd at some point. Oh, okay, you know. I think I've heard, yeah, I heard her name. Good yeah. for her, though. Good for her. Yeah, she's Before quite a. People well, get in on the issue. Okay. Yeah, you know, but you're so. not homeless, are you, Tom? Uh, no, <laughs> but you know, I've just gone through a transition to. I've moved from suburbia to uh, the urban, the urban part of the city of Edmonton here, and I go out for walks, and I. I came here because I wanted more variety to look at and, and interact with, and I've certainly found it. You know, it's um, uh, every night I go down for a walk, and uh, there's people in the streets, and they they look really out of it. A lot of them, you know, oh, yeah. really desperate situations. Um, oh, there's just one point I wanted to raise. Years ago, I was very upset with my business partner because he lived in Terwilliger, which is a wealthy area. And, in Edmonton here. I've heard of it, yeah. And they were wanting to put in one of these houses uh, that you were talking about just a minute ago. And um, the uh, the whole community came up in arms because it would devalue the, the oh, cost of the homes, you know, right? To have anything nearby that had these people walking around and looking rather uh, suspicious. So, yeah. Um, 
I, I realized with him that it really didn't matter about it, how much goodwill it had. It all came down to dollars, you know, and what their investments were doing and all that stuff, you know. So the, it was a rather sad reflection on him, I think. And but his you know, it's, it's, it's that why that scattered site approach is people just move in and you don't even know that. Yeah. You know, well, I, would, I mean, when when you've got an, a, a population that is observable, as it was with the developmentally disabled, when we were dealing with that issue, there mm-hmm. there was value in actually talking with neighbors. And no, talking, absolutely. I mean, there's there was ways. goodwill oh. and it worked. I mean, I, I, I yeah. tell you what what triggered this is I was flying over the city one day, knowing full well that there was extraordinary NIMBY resistance to group homes. And I realized, my God, the city is so big. There's got to be places where we will we'll, we will be received. And we, we spent time on that uh, yeah. in the kitchens with our neighbors talking about uh, our kids, ourselves and our plans and personalized yeah. the issue and found yeah. the goodwill was extraordinary. There was not. Mm-hmm. The, the NIMBY shouldn't have been dominating the discussion. Yeah. It's what it should have triggered is it's important for us to look around and find friends. David, you've got a question or, or your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, given all of this great information, and I really mean that uh, sincerely, um, what one sort of thing could an individual do that would help move this issue of homeless, homelessness along in the right direction? Oh, good question. That's a yeah. That's a that's a that's a. I get you know I get students asking that question eh, often you know around at at the university eh, what what can they do I mean obviously I mean obviously there's all sorts of places where you know especially people our age can contribute through you know kind of leadership around issues you know by you and you may already be on things like boards of agencies and so on I do think though directly. And, and I try to do this and I is is lobbying our politicians. I, I, I just I'm just amazed. I, and I, I you know, I, I used to take it for granted that they know the issue, that they understand it, that they know housing first, for instance. They don't. They don't think about it much. And I think when constituents kind of show up and say, look, you know, we got to do something about this. Um, that has some impact. So I, I, it seems to me that's that's you know that's one way. Um, uh, I mean, we've worked hard. You know, we write op eds. Um, you know, in newspapers to try to promote the. We're like a broken record. You know, to promote you know this housing first approach. Um, so I I really do think. In fact, I think we need we need the public support on the issue because like I said, it's so easy when we, we go down the road of, of, of lack of housing, we start thinking, and, and, I, and I don't, I think it's an important issue, but we start thinking of young people who can't buy homes. And, you know, we think of all the other populations, but the homeless population who, who, who can't get into the housing market. Well, that, um, that certainly has become a recent complexity. I mean, I would think that in the past, we would be less concerned with can we find the real estate? Can we find that? Yes. House? Yes. But with what yeah. we're facing with inflation, uh, with immigration at the large numbers that we're seeing, with the commitments to deinstitutionalize and cut back on our costs, we, we've got an issue that has become increasingly complicated. I really like to reinforce, though, the point that you've made, Tim, and you know I've made it as well, of zeroing in on prevention. It would not be. It would yes. not be unreasonable to expect that our public service institutional infrastructure make a commitment to preparing people for community before their discharge, because of the amount of savings that that seems would seem to reflect, or, or even asking the question whether we're incarcerating people where there may be an an alternative to incarceration, no. so that they retain their community skills before becoming a victim of an institution. Yeah. No, no, I, I agree. And I I mean, I, I'm near the end of my career, but I'd love to test, you know, uh, um, trying to help people coming out of jail to get into housing, you know, because there's a there's an approach called um, critical time intervention. Yeah. It's all about transitioning people in a critical time of their life. Um, and it's not long term, but the group of people 
who have mental health problems and, and often often combined with addictions, they're the ones coming out of jail who, who are going to end up uh, on the street or in the shelters. Well, as a wrap up, and I don't think it's possible to, to summarize everything we've talked about, but three terms come to mind. One of them is the relevance of agency at the personal level, and that is that the individual is in fact committed uh, to rectify the circumstances of their life. The other one was early intervention, how critical it is if we're going to be effective in our rehabilitation and with our Housing First programs, getting in early is essential. And then the final one, which we just touched on a moment ago, which was prevention. Uh, and that is getting getting early into the cycle, uh, even as, as as it relates to our family uh, and providing uh, our, our kids with an education called citizenship uh, at school. But uh, Tim, um, it's getting late in the day. I want to thank oh, you. I want to thank those who joined us today, Margaret in Toronto, Ed, David, Mel, Tom, Dawn, of course, Norm. Great to see you. Uh, Shara, hope to see you again as we continue this series. Uh, and Clyde. So I'm going to call it good night.